is twofold. One is I want to level our knowledge about what we've learned in the last decade about cyberspace and U.S. strategy. The second thing I want to do is convince you, here's the polemic in the piece, that cyber matters, even if it doesn't matter for the evocative, scary ways in which we originally thought cyber mattered 10 years ago. And that strategy, while wonky and a bit uh, unwieldy, actually really matters. And for those that pay attention to the details about how strategy is drafted and implemented, that we can actually make a very large difference in U.S. cyber uh, policies by focusing on strategy. So those are my two overarching goals. So I have to start with uh, the bang, right? So why did people think that cyber mattered for 10 plus years? And I think a large part of it has been a relationship with nuclear weapons. So when we first started hearing about the language of cyberspace, it came with it the same language we talked about nuclear weapons, cyber um, Armageddon's, and the, the first known cyber attack that actually caused physical effects was a, a cyber attack on Iranian centrifuges and um, that caused them to spin out of uh, and, and go uh, in such an unwieldy way in which they were actually able to uh, push back the Iranian um, nuclear program for a short period of time. So there's been an intimate relationship between cyber and nuclear weapons really from the beginning of U.S. cyber strategy. Um, so much so that at the beginning, the United States actually put cyber command um, and cyber capabilities underneath strategic command, which is the, the command that is typically um, in charge of nuclear weapons. And so for the U.S., this relationship has always been extremely intimate. We think of cyber and cyberspace as a highly strategic domain. Um, but it wasn't just about nuclear weapons. Increasingly, uh, we realized that cyberspace had an intimate relationship with the way in which we fought modern warfare. So every bit about the modern battlefield is digitally enabled, whether it's the, the folks on the ground calling in airstrikes from a version of an iPad to the Air Operations Center and the Battle Management Centers that are all kind of uh, built on this foundation of digital technologies. So, at the same time that the U.S. realized that cyber mattered potentially for this strategic thing, they were also realizing, oh shoot, cyber also matters for how we fight and who wins and loses wars. And really, that was one of the big focus for the first five years about how the U.S. thought about building its cyber capabilities. But it was a bit of a red herring. Because while cyber is an extremely important part of modern warfare, extremely important part about thinking about strategic stability, really where it matters is this. The digital economies, the infrastructure, the way in which we receive our, uh, our, our pharmaceuticals, the way we fly, the way we uh, transit on trains, um, everything about modern economies is built on digital capabilities. And because of those digital capabilities, we find that this is also the area in which cyberspace matters the most. So while the US was extremely focused at this like high strategic level on nuclear weapons and uh, conventional military planning, in reality, where cyberspace has played the most important role to the US government, society, and economy um, has been in how cyberspace undergirds the critical infrastructure uh, and the modern way that we live. So obviously, you need a strategy because that's a very, very complicated set of issues that cyberspace crosses across. So what's the point of strategy? For those of y'all who have lived in the policy world for a while, you know that strategy, uh, there's kind of a strategy for everything. Um, and how do you evaluate what is a good strategy from what is a bad strategy? So I'm going to um, proffer here that good strategy does three things. The first, and I think this is actually the most important and actually where most strategies fail, is articulating priorities, 
and goals. So we don't care about everything. There are things that we know are more important than others. In cyberspace, this is extremely challenging because I, sh I just showed from those three slides, almost everything touches cyberspace. So how do you determine what is the most important? And this is where the rubber hits the road for most of the, the US decisions, figuring out what it's gonna prioritize. The second thing which a good strategy does is it signals to adversaries and to some extent to allies what we care about. What are the red lines, the implicit thresholds, the explicit thresholds at some point at which we, f we do not tolerate adversary behavior or in which we're going to support allies? Um, so is there something that happens in cyberspace that the United States has credible means of punishment or is willing to punish? Um, and that has really fluctuated over the years for the United States. And finally, and this is the wonky part, the part that people kind of gloss over, it's not the um, beautiful writing, it's not the kind of the canon form of strategy, but this is where there, it really strategy matters, and that is in the implementation of strategy. How does it delegate lines of effort to subordinate organizations? So when you're talking about something as complicated cyberspace that touches the public sector, the private sector, the military, and the nuclear realm, how do you determine who in the US government is doing what? Um, who should be authorized to do what, and what are the um, delineations and the ways in which they're going to cooperate and contribute. And that is, um, that is where uh, great strategy uh, becomes implemented. Okay, so why do we care about cyber? I know it's 8.30 in the morning, um, it seems a little boring. So let me give you kind of a rundown about why the US government thinks it cares about cyber. And I'll start with the external threat. So the, the cyber strategies over the last few years have identified a few players as the, the common external threat. The top two are Russia and China. And I would say before Ukraine, we clearly put Russia at the top of this list. Russia has been the most prolific and most audacious actor in cyberspace over the last 20 years. Um, largely drawing on their expertise in intelligence, um, whether it was the uh, former KGB going into the GRU um, and the FSB, and then uh, we saw recently um, their kind of foray into information operations and the Internet Research Agency. So the Russians have been, um, been very, uh, very busy in cyberspace, uh, really um, since the 90s, but um, with effect since the 2000s. So um, early attacks on Estonia, but we also saw that the Russians were combining cyber operations with conventional operations, going back to their early operations into Crimea, um, and then leading up into uh, what we see today in Ukraine. Um, that said, <laughs> a lot of the estimates about how uh, effective the Russians could be if they unleash their cyber arsenal um, seem to me perhaps an overestimation when you look at how they were actually able to implement operations against Ukraine. And we'll talk more explicitly about those lessons and what that means for US cyber strategy at the end. So the, the Russian focus is generally on um, pairing cyber operations with either a strategy of trying to create um, disorder and confusion, um, or to pair it with conventional operations in order to, to increase the chance that a Russian military, which is um, a little more outdated than, for example, the Chinese or the United States, um, stand a fighting chance. The Chinese are a little bit different. Um, so the Russians have in the past not really cared about being um, uh, being identified, especially in a lot of their operations that are um, co-located with their conventional operations. The, the Chinese at first were far more covert, um, but they have moved into uh, what I would call as a mass exploitation of information. And so you start seeing that the Chinese are looking at um, very large scale data breaches um, all the way back to the Office of Personnel Management. Um, and so their focus has been on taking as much information as possible. A lot of that is used for uh, internet intellectual property theft. So the idea being that you're stealing information that then um, is siphoned back into Chinese industry and used to compete against American, European, and other Asian allies um, in order to kind of uh, leapfrog other states. So it's kind of the, the cheating version. Um, the other thing that the Chinese are known to do is use information 
um, in order to um, build a, a large database of information for potential conflicts in the future. What we don't see the Chinese doing in the same way that we do the Russians, the Russians are keen to create exploits that create effects. The Chinese usually sit on exploits. So what you mostly see from the Chinese is spying, not um, trying to degrade um, a physical capability so far. Um, we also see that the Chinese are using more mercenaries, so they're trying to um, uh, decrease the chance that the U.S. will identify operations with the Chinese, um, and so and more of a centralization of uh, cyber operations occurring under Xi Jinping. So you have a prolific use of cyber spying, um, as well as an increasingly audacious use of mercenaries and cyber proxies in order to decrease the chance that the U.S. will escalate against the Chinese. So those are probably the most competent of the two actors. Just for a sense of scale, the Chinese estimates are at about 40,000 hackers. The United States um, has about six to 8,000 cyber professionals that they, um, that they have at Cyber Command. Of those six to 8,000 cyber professionals, only a very small percentage of those are what we would consider hackers. So in terms of scale, you're looking at a very, very large scale, um, highly prolific set of actors in the Chinese. More in the nuisance category where we put Iran and North Korea. So Iran and North Korea are both actors that are um, extremely busy in cyberspace. You see them um, conducting operations that are, are a lot less sophisticated than the Russians or the Chinese, but nevertheless um, very active. And so the Iranians have been um, very busy in cyberspace really since Stuxnet, um, and they have launched a series of attacks against regional countries. Um, Shamoon is one of the most famous, where they're going after um, core critical infrastructure and resources within countries that they disagree with in terms of foreign policy. The Iranians have also launched a series of attacks on U.S. banking, um, none significant, with significant effect. Um, there was a whole campaign that the Iranians had a few years ago going after U.S. dams um, and U.S. banking interests, and it got a lot of media attention, mostly because it was very ineffective. Um, they were caught quite often, uh, and some of the dams they were targeting turned out to be kind of like a very, very small scale. So, Big nuisance actor has not had a lot of significant success against the United States in some of our core critical infrastructures. North Korea is a bit of a different player. Um, I think we would most likely think of North Korea when we talk about uh, the Sony attack in which you know, the Kim regime was very upset about a, a pretty bad movie that came out that was making fun of um, the Kim family and probably would have been ignored if the North Koreans had not had such a... Um, a kind of big attack against Sony, caused uh, Sony Pictures huge economic cost. Um, and it was a, but it was a bit of a, a, a sloppy cyber attack. It was quickly attributed to the North Koreans. Um, and so that's kind of what they're known for. Where they've moved in the last five to six years is using cyber attacks as a way to generate uh, resources for the Kim regime. So you have a lot of, um, uh, ransomware, basically. They're very, very good criminal actors at this point, and so they're raising money for the Kim family. Um, and then I think the most prolific threat today is actually criminal actors. So I alluded to this when it comes to the North Koreans, but there's a series of criminal actors that are kind of just ignored tacitly um, that are in Russia, Eastern Europe, and a bit in China. And so these are criminal actors that are focused on critical infrastructure in order to gain revenue. And they are the most prolific, also the most rational and extremely competent actors in this in cyberspace. So um, for those of you who have worked on any government IT, you would know that if you have a problem with your computer, it's really, really hard to get somebody to fix it. Um, but if you have a ransomware attack, they actually are really, really good at making sure that you can pay. So you find some of the best customer service in the world with these criminal ransomware actors. Uh, they will help you use, they will help you pay, they will help you figure out Bitcoin. Mm -hmm.